gentlemen, and welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm Dr. Derek De Silva. We're here at the AMMG conference in Las Vegas. My guest today is Dr. Gary Donovitz. Dr. Donovitz is a young man that I've known for about two years now. I've heard a lot about him. I've had the pleasure of working with him. And the work that he does is, has always fascinated me. Well, first of all, Dr. Donovitz, thank you very much for being here. Well, thanks for having me. So tell me a little bit about your, the whole world of hormones understood, misunderstood, where's the disconnect here? Well, for so long we talked about hormone replacement therapy, but no one really defined what that meant. And because we didn't define it, it all got confused and misunderstood. And we thought we were talking about bioidenticals, but we started talking about synthetics. We started talking about oral versus transdermal versus pellets, but nobody put it all together in terms of hormone optimization. What hormones do you optimize? Which ones do you not need to optimize? And then go from there. And because of that, the patients are very confused. They don't even know what hormone replacement therapy is. In fact, they've heard it's dangerous. That was, that was going to be my next comment is, hormones are dangerous. Estrogen produces this, testosterone does this. I don't wanna do it, I'm, I'm scared. Right. It's, what's the science? Well, the science would tell you that estradiol does not cause breast cancer. And most women don't take hormones because they're afraid if they take estradiol, they're going to get breast cancer. It is just not true. So they still may get breast cancer, but it's not the estradiol that caused it. Men have heard that testosterone causes heart attacks and strokes. Why would you want to have that? Well, the reality is testosterone doesn't cause heart attacks and strokes until you get over the age of 75, and it still has benefits to other things. So there's really not this risk of blood clots, not this risk of cancer, not this risk of heart attack and strokes that people talk about. If they knew that hormones were safe, administered correctly and optimized, more people would take hormones and then use less medicines. During your presentation today, somebody asked a question which I thought was very interesting. What is the difference between synthetic and bioidentical? I mean, we take a lot for granted that people know the difference, don't we? Right, and it was a physician that asked that question, so it's interesting that they really don't know. Bioidentical, bio meaning from the plant, and so hormones can come from yams or hormones can come from soy. All they use the plant for is to get the steroid ring. That ring then gets made into estradiol or testosterone. Identical meaning it's the same hormone that your body made when you were producing hormones, either estrogen or testosterone. It's exactly the same molecule. Synthetic hormones have been engineered so that they are different but may elicit the same response, albeit not as good as a bioidentical hormone. Oftentimes, synthetic hormones are made because you take them orally and the bioidentical hormone's not absorbed orally. Or you're gonna inject it and it's not absorbed well as a bioidentical hormone injected in oil, so they have to make it into a synthetic. And more often, it's because they wanna patent it. And it becomes all about the money versus what's best for the patient. Doesn't it make sense, I mean, just intuitively for people that are watching this, that you would want to give your body something it recognizes versus something it may not recognize? Well, the studies would show you that the receptors in your body are prepared to receive the hormone that they always saw. Meaning, if, if you're low on testosterone, the testosterone receptors are looking for testosterone. If you're low on estrogen, the estrogen receptors are looking for estrogen. If you're low on progesterone, the progesterone receptors are looking for bioidentical progesterone. When you put in a synthetic into the body, that synthetic in, is not identical to what the receptor is looking for. Even though it may bind to it, the response that you get is completely different. So is that where the the issue is with regard to disease, if you will? Sure, because if you bind to the receptor, so it, for instance with testosterone, it binds to the receptor and on the breast is protective to the breast and the heart is protective to the heart. But if you were to take a synthetic hormone, say for instance you were using estrogen and the patient was actually benefiting from that, the blood vessels in the heart were dilating 
everything was going great, and then you were to take, say, a CIRM, which is a selective estrogen receptor modulator, it will bind to the receptor, but the nitrous oxide that's produced, the vasodilatation that happens, is nowhere near what you get from the bioidentical hormone. So you think you're getting the same response in the body. You think you're preventing the same diseases. You think in terms of the bone that you're getting the same increase in bone mineral density. None of that's true. So it depends how you take the hormone and are you using bioidentical hormones. And actually, some of the synthetics are actually harmful. Synthetic progestins increase the risk for breast cancer. They actually cause problems in the brain. Actually, they cause problems in the heart. So they're not the same hormone. They don't even bind to the same receptors. You're an OBGYN. Uh, you've been doing this a long time. What have you seen? How, what does the evolution of this look, look like for you? Well, have I've, we made progress? Yes, no. We're, yeah, yes and no. We're making progress in that more people understand bioidentical hormones. What's been interesting is we're making progress because more people are giving their patients bioidentical hormones, and we've recovered from that sort of big dip in 2002 with the Women's Health Initiative, which again was a flawed study using synthetic hormones and scared a lot of people. We've sort of recovered from that massive dip. But now societies, FDA, everybody is worried about this massive use of hormones, particularly testosterone. So people are trying to legislate and regulate what we do for our patients that's actually making them healthier. So the patients are feeling better, they're getting healthier, and the regulatory agencies are putting up blockades. Why? Is it because they don't understand? What's the issue? Well, I think they don't understand, and I think because they're supported by big pharmaceutical companies, they're never going to be on the side of bioidentical hormones. They're always going to be on the side of, when the people that you are being paid by, which is big pharmaceutical companies, they're, they're giving the FDA 60% of their money. They give ACOG most of their money. They're supporting the board members at the American Board of OBGYN. When all that money is pouring into the people who have policy statements and position statements, it's going to be skewed. It can't be objective. Unfortunately, the patient suffers. Yeah. And that's the problem right now. So until we get some physicians together who actually can say, this is what's best for the patients, this is what the science shows, and have a consensus from physicians, now the physicians are supporting their patients. And we take out the people who are being paid by Big Pharma and actually have the benefit go to the patient instead of Big Pharma. Dr. Abraham Morgenthaler did a consensus paper on testosterone in men. I guess that's pretty well established right now. That, you know, he went through that. It is, and, and even having said that, uh, which is a great consensus paper in men, and we need a consensus in women, which is hopefully what I'm gonna do over the next year with you and Dr. Roussier and some other people, where we set the standard of care for women in hormone replacement therapy. But even on the heels of Dr. Morgenthaler's consensus statement and paper, the FDA two weeks ago came out and says you shouldn't be treating men who have age-related hypogonadism, meaning age-related low testosterone. Meaning as you get older and your testosterone falls, unless you have some disease associated with it, you shouldn't treat it. Unfortunately, that's gonna reduce the quality of life for men if they don't get treated. And that's where the disconnect is. Is it laboratory or is it how do you feel? And until we get the FDA looking at what we've done for PTSD patients, what we've done for guys with low T, how they've re-engaged at home, re-engaged in their work life, how they're able to work longer and, and, and at a higher age, I mean, they're, and older people, then we can make some progress. But the disconnect is assuming that whatever the lab says is really what you're treating. And this is a clinical disease, both in men and women. We need to move away from the lab and move into how do we take care of our patients. You did a wonderful study on, and, on PTSD. It, you know, I believe it's coming to a conclusion or somewhere. What did you find? So we treated 100 PTSD, uh, our veterans who had traumatic brain injury during different wars. The, most of these people were disabled. Most of these people couldn't even get out of their house. And now the majority of them are back to work. They're much happier at home. Moreover, they're off their medications. They were on antidepressants and pain medications. 
We have to realize in this country that 22 veterans kill themselves every day. Mm -hmm. That's a real crime, particularly since the federal government won't pay for testosterone for our veterans. If we could get their hormones optimized and get them off their medications, they would be way, much more productive both at home and at business, and they're not going to be disabled. We're paying them disability. They don't feel productive in their lives. It's psychologically damaging for a guy who was a veteran to know that he can't work, that he can't take care of his wife, that he can't take care of his kids. What if you could reverse all that? Mm -hmm. It's an amazing thing to change people's lives. How does stress affect hormones? Because obviously this is a post-traumatic stress disorder. Has, does, what role does that play with hormones? Well, part of it is they had traumatic brain injury, and because of the traumatic brain injury, their hormones are, are going to be lower, both men and women. Everybody assumes PTSD is in the male, but it's actually both in males and females. And since we're sending females to war, uh, we have a lot of PTSD in females. The stress of the situation when you come home further suppresses your hormones. Moreover, it suppresses your thyroid. So this is not just about testosterone. This is not just about testosterone and estrogen. It's about thyroid also. And in this country, the number one killer of men and women is heart disease. And we do a very poor job of optimizing thyroid. And we know if you optimize thyroid, their immune system is better. They lose weight better. And moreover, you protect the heart better. So if you really want to protect the heart and the brain for that matter in someone who's had traumatic brain injury, it's a conglomerate of, of, of optimizing all the hormones, not just one. Look into your crystal ball and what do you see 10 years from now? I think we win it on the regulatory side. I think we're going to have to have consensus groups. I think we're going to have to have some studies. Most of the studies, because they're expensive, have been done by the pharmaceutical companies. There's not a lot of money in bioidentical hormones because there's no way to really patent those because you make the same hormones I make and the same ones that they make. However, I think as a grassroots uh, effort between the patients and their physicians, which would be nice to get back to the doctor and the patient co-piloting their health, I think we win it. But I do think we need some studies. I think we need some consensus groups. And we need data to show them, here's the data in terms of quality of life issues how much medications they're not taking, and the reduction in breast cancer, heart disease, Alzheimer's disease, prostate cancer, and osteoporosis. When you look at the health benefits to the, our whole healthcare system from doing that, it's magnanimous. I appreciate your time. Keep up the great work. Thank you so much for joining us. And folks, thank you so much for joining us. I hope you enjoyed this. Until next time, I'm Dr. Derek DeSilva, and may you always be blessed with good health. <laughs>